Chapter Twelve of The Chimney Corner by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Panita Springs, Florida. Chapter Twelve The New Year, eighteen sixty five. Here comes the first of January, eighteen hundred and sixty five, and we are all settled comfortably into our winter places with our winter surroundings and belongings. All cracks and openings are caulked and listed, the double windows are in, the furnace dragon in the cellar is ruddy and in good liking, sending up his warming respirations through every pipe and register in the house. And yet, though an artificial summer reigns everywhere, like bees we have our swarming place in my library. There is my chimney corner and my table permanently established on one side of the hearth, and each of the female genus has, so to speak, pitched her own winter tent within sight of the blaze of my campfire. I discern today that Jenny had surreptitiously appropriated one of the drawers of my study table to knitty needles and worsted, and wicker work baskets and stands of various heights and sizes seem to be planted here and there for permanence among the bookcases. The canary bird has a sunny window, and the plants spread out their leaves and unfold their blossoms as if there were no ice and snow in the street, and Rover makes a hearth-rug of himself in winking satisfaction in front of my fire, except when Jenny is taken with a fit of discipline, and he beats a retreat and secretes himself under my table. Peaceable? Ah, how peaceable! home and quiet and warmth in winter. And how, when we hear the wind whistle, we think of you, O oh, our brave brothers, our saviors and defenders, who for our sake have no home but the muddy camp, the hard pillow of the barrack, the weary march, the uncertain fare, you the rank and file, the thousands of unnoticed ones who have left warm fires, dear wives, loving little children, without even the hope of glory or fame, without even the hope of doing anything remarkable or perceptible for the cause you love, resigned only to fill the ditch or bridge the chasm over which your country shall walk to peace and joy. Good men and true, brave unknown hearts, we salute you, and feel that we, in our soft peace and security, are not worthy of you. When we think of you, our simple comforts seem luxuries all too good for us. Who gives so little when you give all? But there are others to whom our bright homes, our cheerful firesides, we would fain say a word if we dared. Think of a mother receiving a letter with such a passage as this in it. It is extracted from one we have just seen written by a private in the army of Sheridan, describing the death of a private. Quote, he fell instantly, gave a peculiar smile and look, and then closed his eyes. We laid him down gently at the foot of a large tree. I crossed his hands over his breast, closed the eyelids down, but the smile was still on his face. I wrapped him in his tent, spread my pocket-handkerchief over his face, wrote his name on a piece of paper, and pinned it on his breast, and there we left him. We could not find pick or shovel to dig a grave. Close quote. There it is, a history that is multiplying itself by hundreds daily, the substance of what has come to so many homes, and must come to so many more before the great price of our ransom is paid. What can we say to you in those many, many homes where the light has gone out forever? You, O oh fathers, mothers, wives, sisters, haunted by a name that has ceased to be spoken on earth, you for whom there is no more news from the camp, no more reading of lists, no more tracing of maps, 
no more letters, but only a blank dead silence. The battle cry goes on, but for you it is passed by. The victory comes, but oh, never more to bring him back to you. Your offering to this great cause has been made and been taken. You have thrown into it all your living, even all the faith you had, and from henceforth your house is left unto you desolate. O oh, ye watchers of the cross, ye waiters by the sepulchre, what can be said to you? We could almost extinguish our own home fires that seem too bright when we think of your darkness. The laugh dies on our lip, the lamp burns dim through our tears, and we seem scarcely worthy to speak words of comfort, lest we seem as those who mock a grief they cannot know. But is there no consolation? Is it nothing to have had such a treasure to give, and to have given it freely for the noblest cause for which ever battle was set, for the salvation of your country, for the freedom of all mankind? Had he died a fruitless death in the track of common life, blasted by fever, smitten or rent by crushing accident, then might his most precious life seem to be as water spilled upon the ground. But now it has been given for a cause and a purpose worthy even the anguish of your loss and sacrifice. He has been counted worthy to be numbered with those who stood with precious incense between the living and the dead, that the plague which was consuming us might be stayed. The blood of these young martyrs shall be the seed of the future church of liberty and from every drop shall spring up flowers of healing. O widow, O mother, blessed among bereaved women, there remains to you a treasure that belongs not to those who have lost in any other wise the power to say he died for his country. In all the good that comes of his anguish, you shall have a right and share by virtue of this sacrifice the joy of freedmen bursting from chains, the glory of a nation newborn, the assurance of a triumphant future for your country and the world, all these become yours by the purchase money of that precious blood. Besides this, there are other treasures that come through sorrow and sorrow alone. There are celestial plants of root so long and so deep that the land must be torn and furled, ploughed up from the very foundation, before they can strike and flourish. And when we see how God's plough is driving backward and forward across this nation, rending, tearing up tender shoots, and burying soft wild flowers, we ask ourselves, what is he going to plant? Not the first year, nor the second, after the ground has been broken up, does the purpose of the husbandman appear. At first we see only what is uprooted and ploughed in, the daisy drabbled and the violet crushed, and the first trees planted amid the unsightly furrows stand dumb and disconsolate, irresolute in leaf, without flower or fruit. Their work is under the ground. In darkness and silence they are putting forth long fibres, searching hither and thither under the black soil for the strength that years hence shall burst into bloom and bearing. What is true of nations is true of individuals. It may seem now winter and desolation with you. Your hearts have been ploughed and harrowed and are now frozen up. There is not a flower left, not a blade of grass, not a bird to sing, and it is hard to believe any brighter flowers, any greener herbage, shall spring up than those which have been torn away. And yet there will. Nature herself teaches you today. Outdoors nothing but bare branches and shrouding snow, and yet you know that there is not a tree that is not patiently holding out at the end of its boughs next year's buds frozen indeed, but unkilled. 
the rhododendron and the lilac have their blossoms already wrapped in cere cloth waiting in patient faith under the frozen ground the crocus and the hyacinth and the tulip hide in their hearts the perfect forms of future flowers and it is even so with you your leaf buds of the future are frozen but not killed the soil of your heart has many flowers under it cold and still now but they will yet come up and bloom the dear old book of comfort tells of no present healing for sorrow any chastening for the present seemeth joyous but grievous but afterwards it yieldeth peaceable fruits of righteousness we as individuals as a nation need to have faith in that afterwards it is sure to come sure as spring and summer to follow winter there is a certain amount of suffering which must follow the rending of the great cords of life suffering which is natural and inevitable it cannot be argued down it cannot be stilled it can no more be soothed by any effort of faith and reason than the pain of a fractured limb or the agony of fire on the living flesh all that we can do is brace ourselves to bear it calling on god as the martyrs did in the fire and resigning ourselves to let it burn on we must be willing to suffer since god so wills there are just so many waves to go over us just so many arrows of stinging thought to be shot into our soul just so many faintings and sinkings and revivings only to suffer again belonging to and inherent in our portion of sorrow and there is a work of healing that god has placed in the hands of time alone time heals all things at last yet it depends much on us in our suffering whether time shall send us forth healed indeed but maimed and crippled and callous or whether looking to the great physician of sorrows and co-working with him we come forth stronger and fair even for our wounds we call ourselves a christian people and the peculiarity of christianity is that it is a worship and doctrine of sorrow the five wounds of jesus the instruments of the passion the cross the sepulchre these are its emblems and watchwords in thousands of churches amid gold and gems and altars fragrant with perfume are seen the crown of thorns the nails the spear the cup of vinegar mingled with gall the sponge that could not slake the burning death thirst and in a voice choked with anguish the church in many lands and divers tongues prays from age to age quote, by thine agony and bloody sweat by thy cross and passion by thy precious death and burial Close quote. mighty words of comfort whose meaning reveals itself only to souls fainting in the cold death sweat of mortal anguish they tell all christians that by uttermost distress alone was the captain of their salvation made perfect as a saviour sorrow brings us into the true unity of the church that unity which underlies all external creeds and unites all hearts that have suffered deeply enough to know that when sorrow is at its utmost there is but one kind of sorrow and but one remedy what matter in extremis whether we be called romanist or protestant or greek or calvinist we suffer and christ suffered we die and christ died he conquered suffering and death he rose and lives and reigns and we shall conquer rise live and reign the hours on the cross were long the thirst was bitter the darkness and horror real but they ended after the wail my god why hast thou forsaken me came the calm it is finished pledge to us all that our it is finished shall come also christ arose fresh joyous no more to die and it is written that 
when the disciples were gathered together in fear and sorrow he stood in the midst of them and showed unto them his hands and his side and then they were glad already had the healed wounds of jesus become pledges of consolation innumerable thousands and those who like christ have suffered the weary struggles the dim horrors of the cross who have lain like him cold and chill in the hopeless sepulchre if his spirit wakes them to life shall come forth with healing power for others who have suffered and are suffering count the good and beautiful ministrations that have been wrought in this world of need and labor and how many of them have been wrought by hands wounded and scarred by hearts that have scarcely ceased to bleed how many priests of consolation is god now ordaining by the fiery imposition of sorrow how many sisters of the bleeding heart daughters of mercy sisters of charity are receiving their first vocation in tears and blood the report of every battle strikes into some home and heads fall low and hearts are shattered and only god sees the joy that is set before them and that shall come out of their sorrow he sees our morning at the same moment that he sees our night sees us comforted healed risen to a higher life at the same moment that he sees us crushed and broken in the dust and so though tenderer than we he bears our great sorrows for the joy that is set before us after the napoleonic wars had desolated europe the country was like all countries after war full of shattered households of widows and orphans and homeless wanderers a nobleman of silesia the baron von kotwitz who had lost his wife and all his family in the reverses and sorrows of the times found himself alone in the world which looked more dreary and miserable through the multiplying lenses of his own tears but he was one of those whose heart had been quickened in its death anguish by the resurrection voice of christ and he came forth to life and comfort he bravely resolved to do all that one man could to lessen the great sum of misery he sold his estates in silesia bought in berlin a large building that had been used as barracks for the soldiers and fitting it up in plain commodious apartments formed there a great family establishment into which he received the wrecks and fragments of families that had been broken up by the war orphan children widowed and helpless women decrepit old people disabled soldiers these he made his family and constituted himself their father and chief he abode with them and cared for them as a parent he had schools for the children the more advanced he put to trades and employments he set up a hospital for the sick and for all he had the priestly ministrations of his own christ-like heart the celebrated professor tholuck one of the most learned men of modern germany was an early protege of the old barons who discerning his talents put him in the way of a liberal education in his earlier years like many others of the young who play with life ignorant of its needs tholuck piqued himself on lordly scepticism with regard to the commonly received christianity and even wrote an essay to prove the superiority of the mohammedan to the christian religion in speaking of his conversion he says quote, what moved me was no argument nor any spoken reproof but simply that divine image of the old baron walking before my soul that life was an argument always present to me and which i could never answer and so i became a christian Close quote. in the life of this man we see the victory over sorrow how many with means like his when desolated by like bereavements have lain coldly and icily gazing on the miseries of life and weaving around themselves an icy tissues of doubt and despair doubting the being of a god doubting the reality of a providence doubting the divine love embittered and rebellious 
against the power which they could not resist, yet to which they would not submit. In such a chill heart-freeze lies the danger of sorrow, and it is a mortal danger. It is the torpor that must be resisted, as the man in the whirling snows must bestir himself, or he will perish. The apathy of melancholy must be broken by an effort of religion and duty. The stagnant blood must be made to flow by active work, and the cold hand warmed by clasping the hands outstretched toward it in sympathy or supplication. One orphan child taken in, to be fed, clothed, and nurtured, may save a heart from freezing to death, and God knows this war is making but too many orphans. It is easy to subscribe to an orphan asylum, and go on in one's despair and loneliness. Such ministries may do good to the children who are thereby saved from the street, but they impart a little warmth and comfort to the giver. One destitute child housed, taught, cared for, and tended personally will bring more solace to a suffering heart than a dozen maintained in an asylum. Not that the child will probably prove an angel, or even an uncommonly interesting mortal. It is a prosaic work, this bringing up of children, and there can be little rose water in it. The child may not appreciate what is done for him, may not be particularly grateful, may have disagreeable faults, and continue to have them after much pains on your part to eradicate them, and yet it is a fact that to redeem one human being from destitution and ruin, even in some homely everyday course of ministrations, is one of the best possible tonics and alternatives to a sick and wounded spirit. But this is not the only avenue to beneficence which the war opens. We need but name the service of hospitals, the care and education of the freedmen, for those are charities that have long been before the eyes of the community, and have employed thousands of busy hands, thousands of sick and dying beds to tend, a race to be educated, civilized and Christianized, surely were work enough for one age, and yet this is not all. War shatters everything, and it is hard to say what in society will not need rebuilding and binding up and strengthening anew. Not the least of the evils of war are the vices which a great army engenders wherever it moves. Vices peculiar to military life, as others are peculiar to peace. The poor soldier perils for us not merely his body, but his soul. He leads a life of harassing and exhausting toil and privation, a violent strain on the nervous energies, alternating with sudden collapse, creating a craving for stimulants, and engendering the formation of fatal habits. What furies and harpies are those that follow the army, and that seek out the soldier in his tent, far from home, mother, wife, and sister, tired, disheartened, and tempted him to forget his troubles in a momentary acceleration that burns only to chill and to destroy. Evil angels are always active and indefatigable, and there must be good angels enlisted to face them. And here is employment for the slack hand of grief. Ah, we have known mothers bereft of sons in this war, who have seemed at once to open wide their hearts and to become mothers to every brave soldier in the field. They have lived only to work, and in place of one lost, their sons have been countered by thousands. And not least of all the fields for exertion in Christian charity opened by this war is that presented by womanhood. The war is abstracting from the community its protecting and sheltering elements, and leaving the helpless and dependent in vast disproportion. For years to come, the average of lone women will be largely increased, and the demand always great, or some means by which they may provide for themselves in the rude jostle of the world will become more urgent and imperative. Will any one sit pining away in inert grief when two streets off are the midnight dance-houses where girls of twelve, 
thirteen and fourteen are being lured into the way of swift destruction how many of these are daughters of soldiers who have given their hearts blood for us and our liberties two noble women of the society of friends have lately been taking the gauge of suffering and misery in our land visiting the hospitals at every accessible point pausing in our great cities and going in their purity to those midnight orgies where mere children are being trained for a life of vice and infamy they have talked with these poor bewildered souls entangled in toils as terrible and inexorable as those of the slave market and many of whom are frightened and distressed at the life they are beginning to lead and earnestly looking for the means of escape in the judgment of these holy women at least one-third of those with whom they have talked are children so recently entrapped and so capable of reformation that there would be the greatest hope in efforts for their salvation while such things are to be done in our land is there any reason why any one should die of grief one soul redeemed will do more to lift the burden of sorrow than all the blandishments and diversions of art all the alleviations of luxury all the sympathy of friends in the roman catholic church there is an order of women called the sisters of the good shepherd who have renounced the world to devote themselves and their talents and property entirely to the work of seeking out and saving the fallen of their own sex and the wonders worked by their self-denying love on the hearts and lives of even the most depraved are credible only to those who know that the good shepherd himself ever lives and works with such spirits engaged in such work a similar order of women exists in new york under the direction of the episcopal church in connection with st luke's hospital and another in england who tend the house of mercy of cluer such benevolent associations offer objects of interest to that class which most needs something to fill the void made by bereavement the wounds of grief are less apt to find a cure in that rank of life where the sufferer has wealth and leisure the poor widow whose husband was her all must break the paralysis of grief the hard necessities of life are her physicians they send her out to unwelcome yet friendly toil which hard as it seems has yet its healing power but the sufferer surrounded by the appliances of wealth and luxury may long indulge in the baleful apathy and remain in the damp shadows of the valley of death till strength and health are irrevocably lost how christ-like is the thought of a woman graceful elegant cultivated refined whose voice has been trained to melody whose fingers can make sweet harmony with every touch whose pencil and whose needle can awake the beautiful creations of art devoting all these powers to the work of charming back to the sheep's fold those wandering and bewildering lambs whom the good shepherd still calls his own jenny lind once when she sang at a concert for destitute children exclaimed in her enthusiasm quote, is it not beautiful that i can sing so Close quote. and so may not every woman feel when her graces and accomplishments draw the wonder and charm away evil demons and soothe the sore and sickened spirit and make the christian fold more attractive than the dizzy gardens of false pleasure in such associations and others of kindred nature how many of the stricken and bereaved women of our country might find at once a home and an object in life motherless hearts might be made glad in a better and higher motherhood and the stock of earthly life that seemed cut off at the root and dead past recovery may be grafted upon with a shoot from the tree of life which is the paradise of god so the beginning of this eventful eighteen sixty five which finds us still treading the wine-press of our great conflict should bring with it a serene and solemn hope a joy such as those had with whom in the midst of the fiery furnace there walked one like unto the son of god 
the great affliction that has come upon our country is so evidently the purifying chastening of a father rather than the avenging anger of a destroyer that all hearts may submit themselves in a solemn and holy calm to bear the burning that shall make us clean from dross and bring us forth to a higher national life never in the whole course of our history have such teachings of the pure abstract right been so commended and forced upon us by providence never have public men been so constrained to humble themselves before god and to acknowledge that there is a judge that ruleth in the earth verily his inquisition for blood has been strict and awful and for every stricken household of the poor and lowly hundreds of households of the oppressor have been scattered the land where the family of the slave was first annihilated and the negro with all the loves and hopes of a man was proclaimed to be a beast to be bred and sold in market with the horse and the swine that land with its fair name virginia has been made a desolation so signal so wonderful that the blindest passer-by cannot but ask for what sin so awful a doom has been meted out the prophetic visions of nat turner who saw the leaves drop blood and the land darkened have been fulfilled the work of justice which he predicted is being executed to the uttermost but when this strange work of judgment and justice is consummated when our country through a thousand battles and ten thousands of precious deaths shall have come forth from this long agony redeemed and regenerated then god himself shall return and dwell with us and the lord god shall wipe away all tears from all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he utterly take away End of chapter 12